me okay good morning welcome to christ chapel we are glad you're with us today whether in person or online thank you for being here uh we're our service today will be about an hour and 15 minutes we're going to have some music we'll have a message but we'll also be taking prayer requests so if you're here we'll ask for those at that time and if you're online if you could put those in the comment section or send it to prayer at christchapel.com uh, especially if you're watching later um, that way you can get to our prayer team Again, we're thankful for you to be here. Glad we got a day to celebrate and worship God. So if you'll uh, stand with me and let's go to God in prayer. God, we thank you, Lord, for this day that we have, a day of honoring you, of celebrating who you are. So God, we ask that your Holy Spirit will minister to us and through us today, oh God. Just work in our hearts. Prepare us for what you have for us today. In Jesus' name, amen. At this time, our music team will lead us out in song. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Down your pride, 
Dressed in mercy, that Jesus provides. Come, all ye weary, broken inside, lay down your burdens. Lay down. Holy King. 
children and their children and their children. May His favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children. May His favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and the children and the children in his presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around you and within you he is with you he is with you in the morning in the evening in your coming in your going in your weeping and rejoicing he is for you 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 retreat last week. It was a wonderful experience, so I've asked if Andre would come up and share a little bit about retreat this morning. Um, do we have a microphone that we can use? Yeah, they've got one in the back. They're bringing one up. We were at retreat last weekend, and we, um, I've been to five or six of them now over the course of 180 years I've been going to this church now, <laughs> and uh, I've always enjoyed it. It's been the three Christ chapels at one time. We got together, so we got to see our friends from the other churches, and we got to fellowship, and we got to listen to a message, and it's always, always been very, very good. This time, it was amazing. Oh, um, I felt the spirit of the Lord in almost absolutely everything we did. 
except for that 14,000 mile hike. Pastor <sighs> took me on in the afternoon. It was 1,412 degrees outside. But I digress. I want to, I just want to throw out right now that retreat is going to be in September next year. So the last weekend of September in 2024, start saving your money. Whether it's you give up a Starbucks, whether you give up uh, going somewhere and put it in a jar, and Sherry will be glad to take your money once we start collecting it. It is so worth it. We had um, a guest speaker all weekend by the name of Alicia Johnson. You can find her on YouTube. Uh, she was a Seventh-day Adventist, was it? Yeah, she was a, a former Seventh, well, she still is, I guess, a, a, a pastor with Seventh-day Adventist, Adventist. And she came out about six or seven years ago. And that wasn't the crux of her compassion this week, but we got into prayer. And prayer, for those of you who've been around for a while, know that's one of my things. Back in the 40 days, we, that was, I was the leader of the prayer groups that met. <clears throat> Catherine has taken over that, and we, I'm part of the prayer team now. And I've always been a very powerful person of prayer. I didn't know anything until this weekend. This weekend was amazing. The Mary and Jesus retreat area and center is absolutely stunningly beautiful. It's peaceful. It just lends itself to um, it lends itself to prayer, to meditation, to a spirit of renewal. Um, request your time off now. When you start bidding your vacation toward the end of this year, yo off on that September weekend. But I just, I really want to encourage you because it's beneficial. Whether you get a little bit out of it, like I have in the past four or five times, or whether you get a major, major sense of what's going on now, it is so worth your time and it's worth your money. And we've got a few things. We've already been talking about um, retreat for next year, and we're bringing in some really amazing new things once we get, you know. Pastor's a little hard to change. You know how he gets, okay. You know, well, yeah, all of us that have been here a while know that. But he's relinquished, and that for him, bless your heart, is really a big thing. And so we're going to take it maybe in a new, different, a new different area. Maybe we're going to keep it the same but pump it up. So start thinking about it. Sherry's going to start talking about it pretty soon. And uh, I just want you to all enjoy. I hope you have as great a time as I did. Thanks. Thank you, Andre. And yes, class 101 for, uh, in school was how to be controlling. So, <laughs> no, but they, yeah, but there are things that, um, that yeah, there are times that it's like, let's see some fresh ideas, some fresh things. So we do have a committee and looking forward to what it's going to be next year and what God can do. So it, it is a great time. I encourage you to be a part of it. Um, there's those times you toy with, do we really want to do this? And then after you do the retreat, it's like, yeah, we want to do this. So, uh, so yeah, it's a great thing. I encourage you to be there. So this morning we are talking about God is for you. And as we get started, I do have a clip about faith that I want to uh, kick us off with just to remind us of, of our work with God. In a world of uncertainty and doubt, faith shines through darkness. It is the unwavering trust in something greater. It gives us courage, connects the seen with the unseen, and empowers us to overcome obstacles. Faith turns storms into opportunities, and setbacks into comebacks finds us through trials, making us stronger and resilient. With faith, the impossible becomes possible. It fills our hearts with hope, minds with clarity, and spirits with strength. Trust in God, embrace the journey, 
for it reveals miracles and realizes dreams. Hold fast to faith, because with faith, we are never alone. So faith, we're never alone. And so that's what we're seeing is faith carries us through. And faith is a reminder that God is for you. And that song we just sang, we sang it over and over and over. God is for you, God is for you, God is for you. Because we need to know that. Especially in a chaotic world with some of the things that we're seeing happening around us. And um, I think we really need it in this day and time in which we live. Lately, we're starting to see some regression of, uh, of laws and non-affirming of the LGBT community and women's rights. And um, it's been over 20 years since I've been getting those emails telling us we're going to hell and that we're missing the point and uh, questioning our salvation and all. But those are back. So I'm seeing this backtracking on some things, and it's like, God, you said you're for us. We need you with us. And, and one of the uh, websites that I get information on regularly, it's for church leaders. And in the past, it was how to deal with issues in the church, how to help increase like the giving and things to do to help you in the process. Well, it's become very political. And John said, why do you still leave, read that thing? It's like, because I want to know what's going on out there. But they even had one this last week about Christian nationalism. And it's like, I wish you guys would just worry about your own business and not try to get in everybody else's business. I think that would make the world a much better place just because you're miserable and your relationship with God. Don't force that on the rest of us. So it's just kind of was irritating. But, and yes, I can also, I would love to see Christian principles throughout the world, that God's love, God's grace, God's acceptance. I would be for that. But as far as forcing our country into a theocracy, that's not going to work because we've seen that in other countries where religion has taken hold and, and has been the leading force and it's been, been with bad results. Jesus was not about more rules and more religiosity. Jesus was about changing the heart. And when that kingdom of God does come, whenever this world is set up, Jesus will be in charge of it, not these humans who think they've got the whole idea of who God is. It'll be Jesus himself. So those are things that we look at, and when we see this stuff that um, maybe not just in that realm of life of where we feel like things or attacks are coming and some of the things that we've stood for are being pulled away from us, there are other things in life that attack us that we just feel brought down about and just need to remember God is for us. So we're going to look at Isaiah chapter 41, read verses 8 through 14. It says, But you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, you descendants of Abraham, my friend, I took you from the ends of the earth, from its furthest corners. I called you, I said, you are my servant. I have chosen you and have not rejected you. So do not fear for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And all who rage against you will surely be ashamed and disgraced. Those who oppress you will be as nothing and perish. Though you search for your enemies, you will not find. Those who wage war against you will be as nothing at all. For I am the Lord your God who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, Do not fear, I will help you. Do not be afraid, you worm, Jacob, little Israel. Do not fear, for I myself will help you, declares the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. God is there for us. Now, if we go on, jump into chapter 42, which we won't, but if you want to jump into chapter 42, 1 through 9, it describes us who that Redeemer is and which is Christ. So it just shows us that he's telling you, I'm going to save you. I'm going to be there for you. And this is the plan of how it's going to work. But it's a great passage of comfort for us. And there are promises in there that lets us know that whenever the enemy attacks, that God is there to protect us and care for us and strengthen us and help us through the circumstances. We're not told they won't go away. We're not told there won't be any problems in life. We would love that. In fact, that's what a lot of, you know, follow God and nothing bad will ever happen to you is not anything in Scripture. It's just when those bad things happen, you're not in it alone. God gives you that strength and power to go through it. And when our faith falters, we have God with us. And when we're feeling that our problems have, as they say in Texas, whooping upon us, we know we have God that is there to guide us through. So first of all, he tells them, Israel, you're my chosen. 
God's chosen people. And we're grateful for the fact they're God's chosen. And, and just the fact that Israel still exists after thousands of years, being a small country, could be easily overrun, yet still often the center of our world conversations, lets us know God is there for them. Now, I'm not saying that God is about all of their politics and in favor of all they did, because you just read the Hebrew scriptures, and there was a lot of kings that did things that God was not happy with. So just because we know God is for Israel doesn't mean God is behind every political thing they say or do, but we know that God has held them and secured them and kept them. And we know that can be for us because we know God doesn't always agree with everything we do either. That there's stuff in our life that we may go astray, but yet we see God has still chosen us. And we think, well, yeah, but that's Israel. Hebrew scriptures declare they're God's chosen people. How do we make this about us? Well, Paul clarifies this in Galatians 3, 6, and 7. He says, just as Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, so you see, those who believe are the descendants of Abraham. And you read in Romans, Paul goes on to declare that we have been grafted into the family of Abraham. So when we see that, it's, oh, okay, then if I'm grafted into this family, then the promises that were for Israel are for the kingdom of God, and me being a part of the kingdom of God, that applies to me as well. It gives us that sense of hope of saying, yeah, I can pull out these promises of the Hebrew scripture and apply them to my own life. And since we're part of God's chosen, then as we claim these promises, the first thing he tells us is, do not fear. Fear is one of our greatest enemies all around us. As we see in our political system, it's fear that wins votes. We may not be thrilled with the candidate of our liking, but we're less afraid of what they will do than what someone else may do. So we let fear control, and it drives that election process. We live in a place where we have to lock our doors. We have to secure the things we have for fear that someone else will take what we have worked so hard to get. They're real fears, but we can't allow fear to drive us. We can't let the fear overwhelm us to where we just give up. We have to realize that in the midst of these things, God is there for us. Whenever we allow fear to rule and reign in our life, we make those rash decisions. We often overreact, or we just completely run away, that fight or flight thing. So that's why whenever the fear is around us, when we see things that we may have fear of in our life, that we need to turn to faith in God to know that despite our fears, God can help us. That our faith is in God, not so much people. Because we know people will fail. Even Jesus, it says, and I can't remember exactly where, but Jesus, it says, uh, he didn't trust anyone. So it's like even Jesus knew human because he knew what was in their heart. So there's times that Jesus didn't even trust people. But we know in our own life we can trust God. And God has just reminded Israel that even though they may be scattered to the ends of the earth, God will bring them back. And we see scripture telling stories of that. There are uh, times whenever people have been sent away for famine or whatever and then come back to Israel. God brought them back. We see even with uh, Joseph and Mary that whenever Jesus was born, they had to flee Israel for a time and go into Egypt. But God brought them back. So it just reminds us that there are those times that we may feel like we've been scattered. And in our community, there's those who do feel they've been scattered that they're not allowed into their church families or into the church home, and they're told that all Christianity doesn't accept them, and God has brought them to a home where they feel connected. God will restore that which is needed as we need that to happen in our life. So Isaiah also declares not only do we not allow fear to rule us, but to remember that we are God's servants. And as servants of God, it's not forced upon us. Because that's where, again, with slavery, it's a force issue. As being a servant of God, it is a choice. We can leave if we desire. Our hearts can say, we don't want to follow you, God, anymore. But if we become a servant of God, we put ourselves under that umbrella, under the protection of God. And will we be willing servants of God with those things in our life that God has asked of us? Are we serving God in the good times and the bad times? Because I've seen people leave for either one. Things are good, they don't need God anymore. But as soon as things are bad, they're back. 
Then I've had others in our congregation who, as long as things were good, they were okay. But as long, look, when something bad happened, they decided God gave up on them, so they gave up on God. Instead of allowing it to be a faith builder, a way for them to strengthen their walk with God. And so we're told as we are grafted in this family that we are part of the family of God. And as with any family, none of us are exactly alike, which we can be grateful. There's times I wish you were more like me. There's other times I'm glad you're not. <laughs> but there's those times that we just see that God is a creative being that has made each of us creative and unique in our own way. That God took time when he created you, when God created you. All of our past experiences, influences, dreams, those are what God used to shape and mold us. So whenever we're part of the family, it doesn't mean we're going to be a cookie-cutter Christian and everyone's going to look alike and, and everyone's going to act alike and, you know, the women are going to dress alike and all have the same haircut, the whole thing. No, we are still individuals. We're unique. And I know there's those churches that require that certain people dress certain ways. Or, you know, if you're a woman, you have to dress this way. If you're a man, you have to dress that way. God has allowed us our individuality. So that's what gives us in that ability to say, God, use me as you have created me. For your purpose and your plan, as a servant of yours, let me follow through with what you want in my life. And God is with us no matter what is around us, no matter what may distress us, no matter what may disappoint us or make us distraught, God is there. <clears throat> We're told in Hebrews 13, 5 through 6, it says, Keep your lives free from the love of money and can be content with what you have. That would eliminate a lot of our fears in life. But then he says, because, why do we not allow this to be rule us? Because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? With God as our helper, then we don't live in fear of having enough. We trust God will supply. We don't put our whole work, work, life into work and, and getting more and more and more as this society has seemed to teach. In fact, we, there's that prosperity message that the more you have, the more blessed you are of God. And that's not necessarily a blessing. But what we see is God is there no matter what comes our way. And it even says that he will uphold us, that God upholds us by God's own strength. And it says, by his righteous right hand. Well, that word righteous is significant. That word righteous means that which is right and just. Meaning that when God lifts us up, it is in all fairness. It is in with justice in our life, even though injustice may be all around us. That people may be unjust and unfair. The world isn't fair, but we know God is. That gives us that confidence of who we put our trust in. The fact that it's God's right hand is, again, showing us that the right hand is seen as the hand of blessing in both the Hebrew scriptures and the Christian scriptures. That it's the right hand of blessing, of honor and strength. And, and unfortunately, because it says that the right hand of God, that's the hand, the hand of blessing, that in our society, even when my sister was born, she's left-handed, that they tried to make her right-handed because the right hand is the hand of blessing. The left hand, you must have some type of evil. My poor mom, one to impress everybody, she got a left-handed daughter and a gay son. I mean, it's like the <laughs> poor thing. She got double whammy there. But it just reminds us that God holds us up in his hand of blessing. And we can count on God's blessings. In Deuteronomy 28, 8, it says, The Lord will send a blessing on your barns and on everything you put your hand to. The Lord your God will bless you in the land that God has given you. Whatever we put our hand to do, God will bless it as we allow God to work in our life. And we need that pronouncement of blessings in our life, don't we? We need to be able to provide for ourselves. We need to be able to, to live in this society that the economy bounces ever which way it seems like the last few years, that we be able to trust that God is there and will bless the work that we of our hands and will help us through. <clears throat> But too often we limit those blessings of God to the physical things. We just hope just finished teaching us on the Beatitudes, and what do they all start with is blessed or you're blessed if. Those are not external things that happen to us. It's internal. So when we see the blessings of God, yes, God will provide for our needs. Believe that completely and totally. But it's not about us acquiring so much 
in our life, but it's more about are we allowing God to work within our heart and our life so that we know that God is there for us. The things that we do is to receive that internal blessing, eternal blessings as well. <clears throat> because if we just focus on the material things of this world, if we're too rich, we're worried about someone's going to try to get it. If we're too poor, we're going to worry about what we're going to do to eat. And that, that worry is on each end of the spectrum. But if we can just trust God and not try to worry about we got to have the most or we're, we're just going to need it all, then we realize we're missing the point. God wants to bless our heart and our life. And, and as Isaiah continues, he's talking about, yes, this is what God wants to do for you. This is how God wants to work within your life. And then he starts bringing in the point of, now well, let's look at your enemies. So we're going to look at God and our enemies, those enemies that come against us. And, and as we see, when he talks about our enemies, he has referred to Abraham as the opposite of an enemy, as God's friend. Abraham was a friend of God. That, that word in the Hebrew literally means loving me. God loves him. This is God's commitment to Abraham. So we want to break into song, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Sometimes we need reminded of that love as well, that God loves us, that we too are a friend of God. And Isaiah points out that this connection of family as a friend of God is opposite of how God will deal with our enemies. And yes, we do have enemies in our life. We think of enemies as people. And a lot of times when we think those things against us, we have a person that comes to mind. But can we look beyond that to our enemies are our trials, our troubles, those attacks that come to our health, our finances, our way of, of living. All of these things are the enemy. This is the enemy of our soul that attacks us. We're not talking about people. Too often we want to attack the people. We need to make this a spiritual battle. What is causing them to act the way they are? What is it that they have done that has become the enemy of our life because of the things around us that we're having to struggle with now because of actions of others around us? And as it even goes on, he says, and they will be put to shame. Typically, whenever the enemy comes against us, their goal is to put us to shame. But it's not going to affect us that same way. No matter what comes our way, it also says it's not going to completely destroy you. But yet we know there were the martyrs of Scripture who gave up their life. So is this Scripture not true? What about it? Because we think temporally. We think, oh, they gave up their life so God didn't save them, God didn't protect them for their enemies. They still have their place in the kingdom of God for all of eternity. And until Jesus returns, the only way we get off this planet is if we die. So there are things that will lead to death. And death is not anything we have to worry about because we're even told in the Christian Bible that Jesus put death to shame. He destroyed the power of death. So even if our trial takes us to the point of death, if standing up for our faith puts us to the point of death. We are store, still victorious. We do not live in shame at all because God has lifted us up. We have that eternity. And yes, there are things that threaten us that we should be concerned about. I'm concerned about these unjust laws and the oppression that is coming up on people. I'm concerned about what's happening there, but I have to realize that the enemy is not these people who are making these laws. It's what's instigating. What's that spirit behind all of this that's causing such trials and troubles? But I know in our own being, of us trying to be the LGBT community, the attempt to shame LGBTQ people with some of the things that are being presented and trying to say that LGBTQ people are certain ways, trying to bring shame, we've kind of taken that back by having what our celebration is called pride celebration. And I know people jump on that. Well, pride is a sin. No, pride is the opposite of shame. And we're saying we're not going to be shamed. We will be who God created us to be. And as God works, that shame is reversed. And we've seen it in so many that have become people of society that look at and say, well, they're gay and look at what they have been able to accomplish. 
look throughout history, and we start realizing the people who tried to shame them are now, that shame has turned to glory in their life of what they brought to our society. We see God is able to turn all of this around. Even at, at Satakori School, when we were out there um, being there for the kids, there was an elderly woman who walked by us as the clergy and just, shame on you, shame on you. And when I heard and realized what she said, I burst out laughing. I was like, really? <laughs> you're calling us the one's shame when you're doing what you're doing over there? <laughs> it gets reversed whenever we start realizing that God is there to show us that the things that are, are shameful will be twisted around to where we see that God will make it where we don't have to feel shame. We can be who God created us to be. In Isaiah 54, 17, it just reminds us, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue which rises against you in judgment, you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servant of the Lord, and their righteousness is from me, says the Lord. Not in ourselves. Yeah, there may be shameful behaviors in our past or things that we may not want other people to know, but... <laughs> Our righteousness is not because we're so perfect and great. It's because God is, because Jesus is. This is the end is, because Jesus is inheritance from the Lord. And that's why we don't let the enemy tear us apart that, oh, I know something about you. It's like, uh -huh. so God is the God of restoration. God is the God of healing. I'm always reminded whenever the, the, about Michael Cole, who was a, a drag queen for years, and when he started pastoring his church, he had a person come in and whisper as he walked out, I know what you used to do. And Michael says, why are you whispering? So does everyone else. <laughs> if people have something against you, they feel like there's something that you have to be shameful for. But when we see God's work within our life to say, yeah, this is what I was, but look at where I've come. Look at what God is doing now in our life. It gives us that point of where that which is shameful is no longer shameful. We're still who we are created to be. We just may live our life a little differently and a little more in honor. In Romans 5, 3 through 5, it says, but that's not all. We gladly suffer because we know that suffering helps us to endure, and endurance builds character, which gives us a hope that will never disappoint us. All this happens because God has given us the Holy Spirit who fills our hearts with his love. When we realize that, yeah, those attacks of the enemy may cause us to suffer, those things that come upon us, whether it's our finances, health, relationships, things of this world, that whenever that happens, that God is there to strengthen us, to help us to be able to stand. It helps us to endure. God takes that trial and makes good come out of it. Then we know that when we are at our wit's end, God is there for us. And I know there's times that we just say, God, I can't take any more Please make it stop. And God says, watch how much you can handle. It stretches us a little bit more. Because God wants you to know it's not about your power. It's not in your ability. Yeah, you'll break if you have to go that. But God is there with us to help us to handle these circumstances in life. And it even goes on to say, and he will take us by his right hand. That hand of blessing, that whenever we feel we're about to drown, going down for the third time, God is there to lift us up. And of course, that reminds us of the story of Peter in the boat on that night that there was a storm and Jesus comes walking on the water and all they had for security was a tiny little boat and it was tossing all over the place. They look up, oh, this is in Matthew 14 if you want to look it up. But then they see some person walking toward them and that's not normal that doesn't just happen it must be a ghost so all fear is now happening around them that here you may be holding on a little bit of god this is all i have to hold on to and it's tossing like crazy now i'm seeing something else come my way that is really scaring the bejesus out of me and i don't know what to do about this and then jesus says it is i don't be afraid again those words don't be afraid now, Peter, and his, you got to love Peter. I mean, it's like whatever's in his mind, he says. So if it's really you, have me come out to the, you in the water. Says, All right, Peter, come on out. Now Peter has to take that step of faith of stepping out into the water, away from that which was his security. How easy are we to give up even that little bit of security when our whole world is being tossed around and we could lose everything at a moment's notice? And God says, step out of that boat. 
Step out of that that you're holding on to, that you're saying, this is my security. This is what's going to get me through. And Jesus says, no, look at me. And then we get out on that water and we're like Peter. We start looking at everything around. This can't happen. This isn't, what, this isn't how it's supposed to be. No, nothing's going to good come out of this. And we start going down because we are feeling like this is it. And Jesus reaches out and pulls him up. Keep our eyes on Jesus, not on that thing that we think is our security. Upon that thing that we think, as long as I've got my health, and then your health's gone, it's like, oh no, now what? Keep your eyes on Jesus. I keep coming up with old songs, but that old song, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of this world will go strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. All of a sudden, all of this stuff that we think is so important is not. Our security is in Jesus. Now, often when the storms are there, then we just think, okay, God, you do it. You make it all right. And with Peter, he did. He got him out of the water, got him back in the boat. And we're told as soon as they got in the boat, the boat was ashore. So, I mean, Jesus can work those miracles and does, but often God chooses to work through us. That God says, yes, this is your trial. You've moved your way. You have no more security in this life. You're depending on me totally, but I'm still going to work through you. And that's found in the last part of this passage we read in Isaiah 41, 15. That those, yes, the schemes are brought to nothing. God will help you. But then he tells us we will become an instrument in God's hand. Now, in this passage, he's referred to that instrument as um, a sledge with new, sharp, and many teeth. So the sledge that is being created is, Israel, this is what's going to happen for you. You're not going to be dull. You're not going to be ineffective. You're go ineffective. You are going to be able to do the work. I am going to renew you. I am going to create this out of you. But what did he create it out of? That's in, in verse 15. If you look at verse 14, he says, Jacob, you worm. Worms are pretty much helpless. They do some good for our world and go fishing with them, but they're not very powerful. They don't have a lot that they can do. And he says, Jacob, you worm, I want to make you a mighty, powerful sledge. This is the power of God working within our life. Yes, in ourselves, we may not be able to do much, but that's why we depend upon the power of God. And then as the power of God works in us, we're able to take care of that enemy around us. And as we notice, what that sledgehammer is then used is not against people. What does he tell them? Those mountains and those hills will be brought down. Those obstacles that, yes, other people have put in your way, yes, other people have caused, I will help you get through it. I will bring them down, and it's going to be mountains and hills, meaning even those little things that we think aren't important, God says, that's important to you, it's important to me. I will guide you through that. So it just reminds us to be careful about our attacks on people. Let your attack be the object of what's going on around you. Ask for God's help with the health issues, the financial issues, the relationship issues. And to build a relationship, don't attack the person that you're trying to build a relationship with. Just allow God to work within you in those things. And, and again, we, we rather just sit back and watch God work. God, just make a miracle happen. You know, just help me win the lottery. Everything will be perfect. God may say, that's not how I want to work. I want to work with you on budgeting, getting things straight in your life. But in this whole passage, now he repeats twice, he uses the words, fear not, and once he uses, don't be afraid. So he's telling him, you know, that's a big obstacle. That mountain is huge, and I am making you the sledge to bring it down, but don't be afraid, don't be afraid, do not fear. I'm with you. And if we know God is with us, then it encourages us. And we realize that those things around us, those obstacles, not people, those obstacles are what we want to come against. And I know I've often said it, God, I know you said vengeance is yours, but can I be that instrument of revenge? 
You want to go after the person. You want to go after the thing that's hurt you or caused this situation. But rather, we need to say, God, this obstacle that needs knocked down, I need you. And you may even need to remind yourself that those people who you feel are the cause of your pain and agony, that they're also someone for whom Christ died. So if Christ loves them enough to die for them, then I don't think we should be too careless with our words about what we say about them. And it can be tough whenever it's a person that's doing it. But we have to remember that the enemy of our soul is what instigates other people to do stuff. I'm not saying they're demon-possessed, but I feel like there are things that happen that cause them to act certain ways. As Ephesians tells us, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So again, as we keep our focus on the right enemy, that's where we pray. In fact, the, today's Daily Bread was about a prayer meeting that happened for injustices that were going on, and it was just a small handful of people that met, and it grew to where it became a peaceful transition of changes that needed to ma be made. So they, we are instruments in God's hands. And then as we see God work, we're reminded, be sure and return and give rejoicing unto God. We should always thank God for the work he's done. In Isaiah 12, 2 through 6, it says, Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. The Lord, the Lord is my strength and my song. God has become my salvation. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation, and in that day you will say, Give thanks to the Lord, call on God's name, make known among the nations what God has done, and proclaim that God's name is exalted. Sing to the Lord, for God has done glorious things. Let this be known to all the world. Shout aloud and sing for joy, people of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel among you. Just reminding us that as we see the results, give praise to God. This whole passage is just a reminder that God is for you. You are God's chosen. Yes, there's probably some reasons to fear and things in life, but know that God's going to uphold you in God's righteous right hand. God will deal with our enemies, and God will put to shame those things that try to shame us, and those things that try to destroy us will go to no avail because God has ultimate plans for us. And when we're about to go under for the third time, we know that God is there to lift us up, to help us stand when we have lost everything that was our security around us, knowing that the circumstances don't matter to God, that God is greater and above those circumstances. And also aware that God doesn't just do it, God uses us. We then are part of the answer. God opens our eyes to see things. God opens doors for us that we have to walk through. God will give us wisdom and direction on things within our life. And when that mountain is cleared, we be sure and return and give our praise to God. But what we see in this whole passage is God is for you. God is for you. God is for you. Let's pray. God, we thank you for... Isaiah's prophecy, and God, we know it was for the nation of Israel, but we're so grateful that we can take these things for ourselves as well, and that we can apply them to ourselves and see how we can even adjust those issues of our life that we feel have come against us, the things that try to point and say, shame, shame, we can turn and say, it's been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. God, we turn everything back over to you. And God, we know that you will help us with those hills and mountains of our life, that you will help us knock them down so that we can have that, that path going directly toward you, O oh God. And Lord, I thank you that you have given us these promises to strengthen us, to guide us, and direct us. And so, God, as we now go into a time of offering our prayer to you, O oh Lord, we ask that you minister to each heart and life and build up our faith that as we present our request that we know in faith believing that you are going to work through every circumstance. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, that means that are there requests that you would like to bring to God this morning? My childhood best friend's mother uh, has been diagnosed with cancer. She is in the, the 
hospital um, and has a couple of tumors. So just prayers for her. Her name is Anne and their whole family. Thank you. Okay. We definitely need to keep Kelly in prayer. Um, she's going through different treatments that is kind of the, um, as it was expressed, the Hail Mary pass that if this doesn't work, um, looks like it's not, that's kind of their last ditch effort to help Kelly. So we need to pray for, for Kelly and of course for Hope. Oh, Holly, sorry, for Holly and the family um, as well. Um, Pastor Lillian has um, returned to the hospital again with more issues, so uh, we need to keep her in prayer as well. And, um, uh, there, and uh, there's no other requests online. So if there's nothing else, let's go to God in prayer. God, we ask your blessings today upon us. And Lord, you know those obstacles that we're facing in our life. And God, we pray for Anne today. We ask that you be with her. And God, help her body fight this cancer that's in her system. And Lord, we ask that you just minister uh, to her and to her family with your love and your grace, oh God, and be there for them through this difficulty and the things that they're facing. God, we continue to bring Kelly before you, oh Lord. We ask, oh God, for... Uh, we'd love to see a miracle in her life, oh God. We'd love to see her completely restored to health and wholeness. And God, we're just so uh, grateful that you have been able to uh, just encourage her and her, um, her, her attitude and all that's going on with her. God, continue to bless her and minister to her and be with that family, oh God. Be with Holly and Christine, oh Lord, as they um, just see what all is happening to uh, this loved one in their family. And God, we ask that you just minister to that entire family with your love and, and comfort, oh God, during this time. We bring Pastor Lillian before you as well and ask that you continue to, um, to work at healing in her body and the things that are going on. You know what's happening in her system. And God, we just ask that you give her health and be with, uh, with Chris as she uh, has to deal with the things at home and her own health issues and, and all the, the the anxiety she must be going through, God, we ask that you be with her and have your hand upon her. God, we ask your blessings upon uh, each of us here today, oh God, that the circumstances of our life, whatever they may be, Lord, that we go in faith knowing that you are there with us. You've already gone ahead of us. You know what's there, that you are for us. And even if it doesn't turn out the way we would like it to, God, we know that we will be victorious in you. And God, we thank you for these promises. We thank you that you take care of us. We thank you, O oh God, that, uh, that you're concerned about each and every one of us and each and every circumstance of life. So God, we present these things to you for your glory and honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Sherry's going to bring the announcement. Good morning, Christ Chapel. Thank you for coming and worshiping with us today, whether you're here or online. If this is your first time, we have a little card for you to fill out, which you can put in that little brown box back there so we can find out how you found out about us, so we can keep in touch with you, find out all the fun things that we're doing, like Elvis in the Park. If that doesn't say fun, I don't know what does. So we're going to be right over here. If you go out the door right here and go to the left, right there's a library. It's just going to be right in that area. Come and join us. Bring a blanket and a chair. Bring snacks. And come out with us. Bible study is on hiatus for a couple weeks, and we're going to resume on August the 2nd, and we're going to be doing the Book of Revelations. It's 175 weeks. So um, I'm kidding. It's only 20. No, wait, what is it? It's like 11, okay. I mean, we probably could do 175 weeks because there's a lot to unpack in Revelations, but we're going to do the Reader's Digest version of it. Tithes and offering. Oh, before that, if you uh, didn't feel like asking for prayer out loud, but you have some concerns or anything else, you can fill out this little card, which is in the seat back in front of you, and you can put that in the little brown box also. Speaking of boxes... If you would like to uh, contribute to the church, which would be great, because this is your home, and we've got to take care of our home, okay? 
So you can do it with Zelle at donate at Christchapel.com. You can do auto pay, or you can do old fashioned thing. You can write a check. And that you can put in the little black box over by the little windows over there. So let's go ahead and pray over our offering. Gracious Lord, thank you so much for the benefits that you provide for us and just taking care of us and watching over and protecting of us and giving us what we need. And we just ask you to give wisdom to the pastor and the board that they would use your funds to glorify you and to spread the gospel among your people. And we just ask this in your son's precious name. Amen. Don't forget to come and join us after for snacks. Oh, okay. Music team, thank you. Please stand and join us. Be sure and stay. God bless you. Have a great week. <laughs>